Welcome to The Explainer. Today, we're gonna dive into some really clever algorithms. You know, the ones that power everything from music recognition apps to finding duplicate documents all over the web. It's kind of the secret sauce for how computers figure out when two things are almost the same, but not quite identical. So let's start with something that feels like, well, everyday magic. You're out somewhere, you hear a song you don't know, you pull out your phone and bam, an app like Shazam tells you exactly what it is in just a few seconds. Seriously, how on earth does it do that? Well, what you're seeing is a classic similarity search problem in action. And it's not just for music. This is the same core challenge behind stuff like scene completion, you know, where software can intelligently fill in a missing part of a photo by finding similar looking patches from a massive database of images. So really, the core problem is always the same, right? When you have just a mountain of data, we're talking millions of songs, billions of web pages, how do you find the matching needles in that giant haystack and do it fast? This isn't just a neat trick. It's one of the most fundamental problems in all of modern data science. Okay, so you might be thinking, well, why not just compare every single thing to every other thing? And yeah, that's the most obvious way to do it. We call that the brute force approach. It's simple and hey, it's guaranteed to be accurate. But there's a huge problem. It runs headfirst into a massive, massive computational want. Just to put that into perspective, if you have a million documents, you need to make, wait for it, one trillion comparisons. A trillion. Your computer would be chugging away for a very, very long time. And this, right here, is what we call the brute force barrier. When you're dealing with big data, it's just a complete non-starter. No way. So how do we get around this impossible barrier? Well, there's this absolutely brilliant three-step master plan. The whole idea is to be smart and avoid comparing everything. First, we're gonna convert our stuff, documents, whatever, into structured data. Then we'll create these clever little fingerprints for them. And finally, we we'll use a technique called locality sensitive hashing to intelligently group the likely matches together. Let's break it down. Okay, step one, shingling. Before we can compare anything, we first need a way to represent our items, you know, like web pages, in a structured format that a computer can actually work with. And we do this with a really cool technique called shingling. Just picture it like this. You take a little window, say three words wide, and you slide it across your entire document. Every unique phrase that window sees, you grab it and put it in a collection. It's kind of like chopping the document up into a bag of unique overlapping puzzle pieces. So for example, the simple sentence, a rose is red, would become a set of two three word shingles. A rose is and rose is red. And by doing this, we're capturing the local word order and structure, which is, and this is important, absolutely crucial for figuring out how similar two documents actually are. Then each of those unique shingles gets assigned a number. And just like that, we've taken messy, unstructured text and turned it into these nice, clean sets of integers. This is a huge step because now we finally have something a computer can work with and compare mathematically. All right, on to step two, minhash signatures. Now, comparing these full sets of numbers is still, well, it's way too slow if the documents are big. So let's move on, because this is where the real magic happens. This is the similarity fingerprint. So to measure how similar our new sets of numbers are, we use a metric called Jacquard similarity. And it's actually a really intuitive idea. You just look at two sets, you count how many numbers they have in common, that's the intersection, and you divide that by the total number of unique numbers between them, the union. You get a score from zero, meaning no overlap, to one, meaning they're identical. Simple as that. But here's the next big challenge. These sets of numbers can still be massive. So the question becomes, how can we shrink these huge sets into really short signatures or fingerprints without losing that crucial Jacquard similarity information? How do we make them smaller, but still just as comparable? Okay, to really get this next part, let's visualize it. Imagine a giant grid, like a spreadsheet. Every single unique shingle that exists in any of our documents gets its own row. And every document gets its own column. Then, we just go through and put a one in a cell if a document contains that rose shingle. What you end up with is this huge matrix that represents our entire collection. Now here comes the incredibly clever trick behind MinHash. Imagine we take all those rows in our giant matrix and just randomly shuffle their order, a complete permutation. Now, for each document, we just scan down its column and stop at the very first row where we see a one. The number of that row becomes the first component of our signature. And then, we do it again. We shuffle the rows in a different random order, 
find the first one, and that's the second part of our signature. We repeat this process hundreds of times to build a complete compact signature for every single document. And here, here is the absolute magic, the mathematical punchline. It turns out, and this is the key to the whole thing, that the probability of any two Minhash signatures having the same value is exactly equal to the Jacquard similarity of their original full sets. I mean, think about that. We've managed to shrink these gigantic sets of data down into these tiny little fingerprints, and yet they still perfectly preserve the similarity of the originals. It's just an incredibly clever and powerful approximation. You know, this completely flips the normal goal of hashing on its head. Usually with hashing, you're trying your best to avoid collisions, right? You want different items to have different hashes. But here, with what we call locality-sensitive hashing, or LSH, we've designed a system that wants collisions. We are actively trying to make similar items collide, because for us, a collision is a huge signal that we've probably found a match. So let's just put this all together. We started with messy documents and turned them into clean sets of numbers using shingling. Then we used menhash to compress those huge sets into tiny similarity-preserving signatures. And now this final step, LSH, uses those signatures to group documents into the same buckets. So what does that mean? It means instead of a trillion comparisons, now we only have to compare the few items that land in the same bucket. We didn't just bend the rules here, we completely shattered the brute force barrier. See, this whole process isn't really about finding the perfect answer every single time. It's about finding a good enough answer and doing it incredibly, incredibly fast. And it really makes you wonder, doesn't it? What other huge, seemingly impossible problems could we solve not by throwing more computing power at them, but by finding an equally clever shortcut like this one?